Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with Washington University. In this part, we're going to take a look at convolution neural networks. We're going to see how to now take images and have the neural networks recognize something from them. We're going to look both at regression and classification. Classification is where the neural network is trying to tell you what the picture is of, classify it as something. Regression is where you're coming up with some numeric value that you train it for that image. You might be counting something. We'll see how to count paper clips in a couple of images that I put together for a data set. So here we are at the course material. The link is in the description. I'm going to go ahead and open in Colab so that everything displays correctly. GitHub is not always perfect there. And if I want to run the code, we can run the code. You can't run code in GitHub. So for computer vision, this is a little different than data that we've seen before. You will usually use classification. I don't know that I agree with this as much as when I wrote it. You will certainly use regression as well. And the input to the data network is now 3D, so you're going to have a height width. But the, the depth is the color, so that's usually three values, red, green, and blue. The data are not transformed, at least not like they were in previous examples in this course, where we had like columns and we'd z-score something, or calculate a miles per gallon, or a body mass index, or something like that. You will transform the data, but you'll, you'll make it brighter, you'll make it other, other things like that. We'll, we'll see examples of that. Processing time is going to be a lot longer because there's a lot more data coming in, whereas like the iris data set, which is, which is trivial, you had four inputs and one output. Now you're going to have like 256 by 256, a grid of inputs. It's going to take a lot more processing time and having a GPU will help you a lot more. We have dense layers, con and we also have convolution layers and max pooling layers. And by the way, as far as the GPU, you want to make sure that your runtime, if you're running in something like Colab, is making use of a GPU. I have all of the notebooks in this course that benefit from a GPU already set to GPU, but you can set that however you, however you want. Let's look briefly at the classic data sets for computer vision, and then I'll go in and we'll use two data sets that I actually created to do some of the examples. We'll see those data sets in a moment, but the minced digits data set, this is classic. This is like the, the iris data set of computer vision. It's a bunch of handwritten digits and is used by Jan LeCurn extensively. You really tr you treat this as a classification problem, typically. You could treat it as a regression problem, really, but it is the, the digit. So you're trying to have it tell you, is it 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 9? Now, if you treat it as a regression problem, you'd, have to, you'd be introducing some interesting bias that you may not want, because since it's now giving you a number between 0 and 9, that's saying that 7 and 8 are similar because they're so close in number, but their images are not necessarily similar. So be aware of that. This is usually done as classification. There is a data set that another group came up with. This is really clever. They took the digits and exactly the same image size, exactly the same file format, because the mince data set has an unusual file format that I think Jan LeCurn invented that never became mainstream. So here you have a drop-in replacement for minced with more difficult images, though the same size. This is also a trivial data set. It's not overly complex by modern neural network standards. So it's, it's more of a novelty, but it's fashion minced, and you will probably see it on some examples of deep neural networks. This is another classic one, the CIFAR-10 data set. Lots of small images, like you have to almost zoom in on them, but they're not terribly high resolution, of mostly animals. But you learn to classify between those 10 images. And then there's ImageNet and others that are much bigger, usually a thousand different 
uh, images. Also with lots of animals is, is an interesting bias in a lot of these classic data sets. So convolution neural networks, Jan LeCurn is the, is the big luminary behind these. Just to give you an overview, you're going to have an input image, which in this case is 32 by 32. That's fairly low resolution. Usually you're gonna see higher images, but this is from Jan LeCurn's original paper. The brilliance of convolution neural networks is you have this convolution layer, like you see here, where a little square scans across. That square is called a filter. And here there are, I believe, there's six filters. So there's six little squares scanning across. And the weights to each of these squares, the learned capabilities from the square, is the same, is shared across the entire image as it, as it scans across. So it might scan to around there and learn corner. So these, these little square scanners are learning to pick up features inside of the image that are then passed on to the next layer, which is a subsampling layer. This is also called a max pooling layer, where the information obtained in the previous layer is downsampled or information is thrown out just to make it lower resolution. That's generally believed, not always, to improve the prediction capabilities of the neural network. And you can see, as we go through it and more and more of these subsampling layers, it eventually gets quite small. And then we are dealing with the dense layers, which are essentially taking all of the features that these previous layers learned and doing almost like a logistic regression on them, learning to classify the 10 outputs. And the 10 outputs that you see there, those are the digits. So in this type of neural network, you have dense layers, convolution layers, max pooling layers, and potentially even a dropout layer. We'll learn more about dropout layers in the future. The convolution layers, those are those little squares that scan across. The number of filters is one of the hyperparameters that you have there. So how many of those little squares do you want? The filter size, like 32 by 32, however, however big you want to make those convolution layers. Usually they're fairly small sizes, like an 8 by 8 or a 4 by 4, because you want them to learn to recognize fairly small features. The stride, that's how many pixels across it goes. So the, the stride specifies how fine-tuned you want it to really get into there and find things. Padding, we'll see, that just puts some space around the image so that as the square is scanning across, it doesn't just bump into the edge quite harshly. It can trail across the, uh, the padding. And just some, some calculations there. So this is showing the striding. Notice the zeros all the way around, that's the padding. So it starts out with the zeros partially in, and then this, this cyan block will just scoot across it until it hits the edge and it stops there. So the padding caused it to not just hit the edge and stop, it lets it actually see or, or scroll through some of, the, some of the numbers there. And then the max pooling layer takes, now this is assuming grayscale, normally these would be RGB colors, but it takes the maximum of each one, in this case eight, so it's, it's downsampling it by a fourth, so it treats each of these as four, the max here would be eight, the max here is two, and that's max pooling. It's going through all of the color images and just putting in the maximum ones. All right, let's see how to do a regression convolution neural network. We're gonna use the paper clips data set, which we've seen a little bit of before. This is a data set that I created. I have it on Kaggle data sets, but you can also download it from the code that I have right in here. It's a counting problem. You're trying to count how many paper clips are in a variety of images. This is the code here used to download it. So we're downloading paperclips.zip and then we unzip it so that we have the images. And now we're going to need to process those images your, or get them into the neural network. You typically have an X and a Y in machine learning. X is the input that you're making the predictions on. Y is the label or the expected output for each of those rows of X. There's two ways that you can get labels into here. The first way that we're dealing with right here is just like we have done previously in the class, we're going to have a file, train.csv. We load that in through pandas, and then we create a new column. The new column has file names in it. 
So if you look at this data, this CSV file, it's got 30,001, 2, 3, 4, blah, 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 blah. That code that I have up there basically just creates this file name column so that we have the actual file names because the generator is going to use those to provide the Y, because the generator is going to use those to provide the X. The Y is the clip count. So now, using the CSV and using the files that the CSV links to, we're able to provide the generator with everything it needs to be able to train the neural network. We are going to use early stopping so that we don't overfit. And to do that, I am going to take 90% for training and 10% for validation. And we do the typical split like we've done many times in this course before using scikit-learn. Now we're going to create the generators. We'll look more at generators again later in this, this module and see some of the transformations that it's actually doing. But for now, here's some of the things that it can do. We're rescaling, so we're converting all those 0 to 255 RGB values into 0 to 1. You can also horizontally and vertically flip. I am, these are just paper clips on paper, so if, up, there's really almost not a concept of upside down. So we're going to flip them in both ways, and that doubles our data and then doubles it again. That's augmentation, and augmentation is one of the great advances in machine learning in the last three, four years, because it allows the neural network to have much more training data. And we'll be seeing more with augmentation in this module. And then the fill mode, we're using nearest. Flipping doesn't run into this problem, but say you rotate it, if you rotate an image, you're going to have some areas outside of the image that just don't have, in, don't have anything in them. So to take care of that, you have to say what you want to put in that space. Do you want it to just be blank? We put in nearest, and that way it gets some pixels that are fairly representative of what the overall image looks like. Then when we go to flow from data frame, we can also flow from directory, and we'll see that when we do classification next. But the data frame is DF train. The directory is source. The column is the file name, the X, and then the Y is the clip count. We're also going to resize here to 256 by 256. So this is not like pre-processing resizing where you save all the smaller images. This is doing it on the fly. And there's advantages to each. Sometimes you just want your, your data set pre-processed and resaved so that all the images are the same size. Or you may wish to do it on the fly here, like with a generator. Another thing that's important to note as well is for the validation generator, we aren't going to flip anything because we want to validate on real data. That's what's going to tell us the most about how this, this neural network is performing. I don't care as much how it's performing on flipped or other augmented types of images. Then we create a typical neural network. It's a sequential neural network. We have convolution 2, max pooling, another convolution 2, another max pooling, and then finally our dense layers, and then we're, we're done. It is regressing to just one value, which is linear, which is consistent for how neural networks work in Keras. And then we're ready to train it. We create the new neural network, we compile it, and we call fit to actually attempt to train it. And at the end, we print how much elapsed time it took. So here it prints out the structure of the neural network. It goes through training, training, training. Eventually, early stop stops it. Total elapsed time was 17 minutes. So just be aware, that's how long some of these are taking. That's 17 minutes with a GPU. Now, you will probably at some point want to score data for this. So additional data that has come in that applies to your neural network, you need a way to be able to just score it. And you need to use a generator just like before, but you don't want all kinds of weird augmentation going on because while that does help training, you don't care to train these made up augmented values. So to do this, 
what you do is we're loading the data set and we are putting in the same file name so that we've got the clips. And by the way, I can see that I'm actually scoring my train data set. Ideally, you'd like to use test.csv. I will make that change offline. It really has no bearing on what we're actually doing here, but just for completeness. The important thing here is class mode is none because this is regression. When we're scoring, there is no expected output. We need to adjust the image size to the same size as we did the training data so that it's compatible. Shuffle is going to be false. We do not want to shuffle these values. We're not augmenting. Batch size will be one. You can experiment with making that bigger. And then the directory is going to be source. You always want to make sure that you reset the generator. Then you do predictions on it. And then we're going to create the submit data set that has the ID, the predicted clip clown, and we save it as submit CSV. All right, moving on to classification neural networks. We communicate the labels here a little bit differently. So we're going to have three directories named Iris Setosa, Iris Vertica, Versicolor and Virginica. So we're using the Iris data set, but not the same Iris data set you're thinking of. This is another data set that I put up on Kaggle and it has pictures of Iris flowers and you need to classify those flowers into what species they are. So we download the Iris data set, just like before, unzip it, and we can see the directory structure here. There are three folders and each of those folders correspond to the three different types of iris and the images that are in each of those folders are correspond to that label. So here we're going to create an image generator very much like before. They're just pictures of flowers so we can horizontally and vertically flip them. That won't hurt really anything in particular. We are going to shift them so they can shift over by 200 or the other direction by 200 and we're going to also allow them to be rotated. So now we're flowing from the directory. We specify the directory name and we say that the target size is 256 by 256. The classification mode is categorical. For the validator, pretty much exactly the same thing. You'll want to pay attention to this part because when it tells you it found these images and three classes that should correspond to your understanding of your data set. Then just like before, we create the neural network. No difference here. It is classification, so we're using binary cross entropy to train it and we fit it. Here you can see the output. We go through a bunch of epochs and you can see this is, this is kind of gradually improving a bit from 74 to 64. It's not doing quite as well as the paper clips, but again, the flowers, the irises, they do look pretty similar. If you look at Iris Virginica, Versicolor, and so on. And then if you wanted to score it, you would do that really just like the regression. So that's everything on convolution neural networks that I am taking you through in this module. We'll, we'll look at them a bit more as we go through the course, but at a, at a low level or a high level as you prefer, that's what these look like. Okay, thank you for watching the video, and if you want to follow along with the course, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, and if the video was helpful, please give me a like. Thank you very much.